Hi all, let's look at another amazing game from the Grand Chess Classic. This is in round four, Fabiano Caruana, who recently won the Candidates Tournament to face Magnus Carlsen in the next World Championship. Uh, he's playing against Arkady Nidic, so very interesting, dynamic, aggressive player. Let's see what happened in this game. E4 from Fabiano. We have E5, Knight F3, Knight C6. Bishop B5, Knight F6, and now D3, which is very trendy, avoiding the dreaded Berlin endgame. For example, if White Castles, which historically is the most trodden path, we get the Berlin endgame, which uh, has uh, quite good things going for the black position with the bishop pair, and uh, so that's that's kind of avoided. The tension is kept. The queens, the queens are kept on the board basically with D3. Uh, so we have d6, white castles, bishop d7, rook e1, bishop e7, c3, black castles, h3, rook e8, a4, bishop f8, and now bishop g5, pinning that knight, black plays h6, and we have bishop h4 now. Perhaps black should just play bishop e7 here. Nidic is a pretty dynamic aggressive player doesn't mind taking uh, a few risks he plays g5 so it's structurally in theory it compromises both f5 and h5 but actually proving that as downsides is is very tricky uh, against very very dynamic aggressive resourceful players uh, but yeah the provocation is, is definitely pawns don't go backwards basically uh, so can we exploit this later bishop g3 the tone is set uh, for the game, can white exploit these light squares? Knight e7, and it does seem logical to trade off the defense, potentially defensive light square bishop. This is actually taken. Queen takes d7. So, how sensitive are these key light squares, especially f5? Knight bd2, knight g6, knight c4, so knight e3 to f5 is on the cards. Rook ad8. Knight e3. Yeah, and now, yeah, the knight is poised for that f5 square. Black plays a very energetic move here. d5, trying to put pressure on that central pawn. White actually takes this. Um, and now, the clever thing here is bishop g7. If, well, it's, a, it's pretty bad if knight takes d5 here because of knight g4 hitting e5. And also there's knight f6 potentially, for example, bishop g7, uh, well, knight takes e5, winning pawn there. And if um, in this position, f6, we can just nudge this knight with c4 and then knight takes f6 later. It's pretty destructive here anyway. Uh, so this, this will be, a very very bad position basically to allow so that's why this bishop g7 is very important now if it seems to give white the opportunity to hold on to that pawn but on c4 then we have a sort of morphe style gambit with uh, black having loads of piece play and a backward pawn on d3 here this this would be very good compensation for black uh, so white doesn't really want to have a difficult to play position here so it doesn't play c4. Uh, in fact, strikes the center hard with d4 himself now, even at the risk of getting a maybe a nice state queen spawn here is 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 now evident. Uh, it might have been possible technically, it seems, to have taken with the queen. This looks a bit greedy to hunt the a7 pawn, but if we look at this for a moment, this this looks as though it might actually be playable. Uh, at least technically, uh, it might be difficult to play though. So white wants to keep you know the position easier to play. C takes d4, knight takes, and, he, and knight takes d5, which is basically going to be winning another pawn because that queen's been lured away from the c7 pawn. So rook takes, queen takes, queen takes d5, lured away from the c7 pawn. White snags that as well. Rook c8 is played. Rook c1. And now bishop takes d4. Now, although this goes into a self pin, it's this bishop which saves black here from not losing a piece. So we have now queen d2. 
and the queen retreats just to hit c7 so black has uh restored material equality there quite resourcefully knight takes d4 rook takes so is there anything going on in this position is that structural weakness evident even here with just queen and knight are the queen and knight great dance partners or are blacks blacks queen and knight great dance partners so queen and knights often do work well together in in gen general uh terms especially when there's weaknesses around the king it seems you know blacks definitely looks to have an area king than whites with that pawn forward and this pawn there you can see that uh, a knight on f5 is actually more effective uh, than say a knight on f4 but uh, white's the first to get a knight on f5 and the expression knife f5 comes actually from Cochinus and also ben feingold has been echoing that but i keep i keep saying ben feingold and actually it's vastly uh Cochinus, a greek grandmaster who i believe first originated the term knife f5 because it's so aggressive uh it can win so many games it's actually kasparov's favorite place for a knight why is a knight on f5 so good i mean people talking on knight on d5 is good but an f5 knight is also covers quite a lot of relevant squares for king safety if you think about it uh, so it's poking into very delicate squares here so immediately threatening the h6 pawn black defends uh, the h6 pawn and white keeps the knight out of f4 here the corresponding attacking maneuver g3 is played knight e5 now threatens by a free check white plays now queen e3 and here uh to prove the downside of the f5 it's it's not just a case of being pretty and just installing a knight something really needs to to give way and it's here black actually uh although the knight and and the pawn are attacked black might have had a very stable looking move just to keep the knight entrenched in the center to perpetuate threats because when you have central pieces you can keep the perpetuation of threats up and here it seems there is a move here f6 which seems to be equal if the knight's kept in the center even if white grabs the a7 pawn uh check here and check and you can see that the checks hold up and look it's very dangerous it's it's going to be a uh a very dangerous position i'll just stop that for a moment sorry about that so okay let's go back so f f6 uh is it seems as though that's the most stable move just stabilizing the central piece to perpetuate threats but here it, the curious thing knight c4 this knight is a little bit unstable and it's that instability combined with the f5 square which in my view is starting to show that actually this is a downside in practicality not just theoretically in, in practice the f5 downside could be revealed if there's another liability sometimes it takes two liabilities for the opponent to be overloaded with both this is a common theme the the basis of many uh, successful combinations in chess is the double attack which is reflection of that the opponent only has one move so if you can overload them with with more than one issue they're they're having to juggle those issues with knight c4 the knight's less stable and may be prone to mixing with the f5 issue so knight c4 does hit the queen and the b2 pawn but does it create a, a dangerous mix of ingredients now let's see queen c3 pinning the knight for a moment queen e5 so resourcefully you know saying you know, if you take mine out i'll take yours so that would be um taking the queens off is going to be equal as well uh so white actually does something really really uh clever here he he, he invests in this idea that the knight on f5 is actually worth a pawn here so at the moment it's equal on pawns white actually to play well guess what white plays okay queen d3 he's investing a pawn potentially well knight takes b2 is actually taken what we have here though is that dangerous uh possibility that it's not just this square it's this knight could be a tactical liability as well but how do we actually mix those two ingredients together queen c2 is played we have queen e1 check 
King G2. And now, very resourceful move, Queen D1, saying that if you take my knight, I'm going to play Queen D5 check and regain the knight there and at least be equal. So we have here now Queen E4, which offers, believe it or not, yet another pawn. So two pawns invested in what seems to be just the concept. But it's not just the concept here because there is another liability. So that moves it from being a conceptual downside to a more practical one because there's another liability here to mix in with like but we're talking two pawns investment here at this very high level two pawns down has white really got enough in this position well it's going to be one pawn down now uh after queen takes b7 so actually i, I may be exaggerating there so one pawn down after queen takes b7, hitting the knight and hitting f7. Now black is not yet overloaded by the two separate issues. There is a resourceful double defense move. You know, I talked about double attack in chess, but here, double defense move with a single move, protecting the knight and protecting f7. But the knight's still unstable compared to if it had been secured in the center. Now, uh, can white actually prove uh, anything here about that? Uh, yeah, if if knight c4, then queen takes f7 was, was mating. So that's uh, clear enough. So queen a2, very resourceful move. Um, we have now various options which are, are very, very tempting for white. And it seems somehow that Fabio Carana, he, he senses he needs to guarantee this aspect of the ingredients, this knight being a potential liability. The efforts to go straight for the king without making use of this a little bit more, this other ingredient. There's two ingredients in the mix. If he goes for the king in this position, it seems as though white's going to get nowhere. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you can guess white's next move. I, I think I've given you the philosophy of it, but can you actually guess white's actual concrete move if I give you five seconds to pause the video here? It's actually incredible, and it's actually the top engine move as well, uh, at least for my, my engine. White's play here, the top engine move. Can you guess? If I give you five seconds, pause the video now. White's play. It's a fabulous move by Fabiano. Knight e3. It's absolutely amazing. It actually makes sure that this knight can't easily get back towards the center. It's from the center we can perpetuate threats and, and defensive moves. Uh, you know, so the knight's cut out here. You can see these dangerous checks as well. So the knight can't use d3 or c4. You know, we've got the, the check there. Uh, we've got the check there. The knight can't really easily get back into the center. Uh, so black is stuck. Okay, he's a pawn up, but he's stuck with two issues now being combined, uh, which actually shows potentially the downside of one of them by mixing with this other issue this knight as a liability here if white just to show the power of this had played knight d6 then it seems black can also have the dance partners working together the, the knight and queen dance partners so for example check 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 what is, what is white actually doing here it's just even yeah because black's combining not just with f2 but it's got access to d5 uh, so yeah knight e3 if we try knight d4 then uh, here knight a5 queen f3 knight b6 check where, where is white going here uh it's it seems to be technically an even position it's just one move this is curious it's one move and one move only which really is super dangerous and that is this move even from a you know computer perspective this is the move uh it's it's absolutely super dangerous move uh black played king g7 uh we have now because it also controls that d5 square as well it's critically controlling d5 it's not just locking out the knight the queen has got no checks on d5 so you know perhaps on knight a4 you know we white can afford to uh take this pawn for example without worrying about the check so it's, it's not just about cutting the knight it's about keeping control of this diagonal that diagonal check 
So anyway, King G7 was played. Now we have Queen B4. So what is Black actually uh, doing here? The Queen is in a nifty manner having access to that central D4 square. Queen B1. And now we have the move G4, which secures a an outpost on F5 supported by the pawn. So that knight in itself won't be a tactical liability in some cases when the king sort of attacks it will be supported by this pawn. So things are gearing up now. So it's not just the knight on F5, it's this other issue being combined together to really make this the downfall of black. These two downsides together equal a, a major downfall soon. King G8, knight F5. It's this knight and this knight on F5. Two downsides being mixed together to actually create a practical disaster here for black. Queen C2, Queen B8 check, King H7, Queen B7. Uh, it, now this is also magnificent uh, calculation by the way because in this position what would you have also thought was a super strong logical looking move and this is why a lot of people give up chess because they play moves like this they might have spent four hours in a club game and they, they often just I think some just give up chess totally because they realize it's an entirely cruel game and unless you have a total love and passion for the game, like Fisher recommended, you won't overcome uh, this. You need to look at the resolution of resources all the time, even in apparently great positions. Otherwise, you could mess up hours of effort and you think, why have I just wasted like four hours of my life? So here's a very tempting move, by the way. I wonder if you can spot the very tempting move in its refutation. If I give you five seconds here to pause the video. Okay, very tempting move because it ticks the boxes, right? If this was a, a checklist, it's a central move. It's threatening mate. It's coordinating the queen and knight. We've ticked three boxes. Except the cruel thing about chess, the resolution of the resources, is that perverse forcing moves have an influence on your checklist. They basically take your checklist, screw it up, and throw it in the bin. And here, can you see what black plays in this position? Okay, bang, queen takes f2 check because this pesky knight on b2 is actually coming to the center with a vengeance with the express train of the check. So if takes knight d3 check, king e2, knight takes e5, and black's just, just winning there. So that's horrible, and there's no escape really because if you played king h1, then check, and then the queen's come off by four. So it's, it's a nightmare. So sidestepping that little detail is very, very important in this position after king h7 even though it apparently ticks all the boxes it's the forcing moves which can rip up your checklist so queen b7 is more to the point uh so yeah it's it's weird that this b2 knight has such an influence that's just pure cruelty of the chessboard uh, position the exact position so here queen b7 though keeps control of e4 hits f7 Qu king uh, h8 and it's here that white does a much safer alternative to queen e5 much much safer guess what that alternative is if i give you five seconds here white to play <clears throat> okay he plays queen e7 and the game ended here black can't really parry the frets in this particular position if white had been a bit greedy here by the way then it's not keeping control of e4 on queen e4 check this is a bit trickier uh this white well, has a small edge here it's it's much much trickier so uh you don't want to give black the queen e4 check so queen e7 the game ended here let's have a look now uh it's very difficult to parry these threats like queen f8 and queen g7 if check here uh then king g1 sneaky king g1 because black's gonna be running out of checks for example um actually uh oh, i wish i hadn't said that now yeah and no, i think black, <laughs> black is running out of checks okay check and then king g2 and then where are the checks so no checks okay uh so that's that'll be pointless so say queen g6 it's remember it's the two tactical liabilities which come together to actually prove 
a practical disaster. It's the juggling the opponent has to make here. So Queen G6, although that parries the mate threats, it's the poor knight which drops off now after Queen E5 check. And, and it's all knight E7 check as well, actually, more accurate, just winning the queen there. Or if King H7, we just take the poor knight. And that shows that sometimes you do need two liabilities the theoretical liabilities need to be mixed with other ingredients to actually show that they're, they actually are real exploitable practical downsides so anyway very very carefully played but the move of the game has to be that knight retreat it seems to be controlling uh white uh the black knight that's ventured off uh, away from the center so black was really uh punished there let's look at this game ending position so yeah, I mean, a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, no, it's just weak in F5. But you try and prove that against the 2700 FIDE that because they played G5, you try and prove it yourself. And it will be very, very difficult. You have to navigate the minefield of tactical possibilities and, and keep the opponent's pieces also uh, trying to make your argument for you. So trying to pr you know, use this knight to make the argument that this is actually going to be a real problem later. So a fantastic game from Fabiano Caruana. Uh, so yeah, really playing well at the moment. So really an amazing challenge match against Magnus Colson is on the card soon in the next World Championship. Comments, questions, likes, shares, appreciated. Thanks very much.